Greetings everybody, good afternoon. If you're in WA or evening elsewhere, welcome to tonight's session on demystifying AVMED. My name is Dr. Tony Hochberg. I'm CASA's Deputy Principal Medical Officer. I'll be moderating the chat in the background. Uh, today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Kate Madison, CASA's Principal Medical Officer, who's gonna to talk to you about how the aviation medical unit functions, who is involved in aviation medicine, what they can and can't do, and also the role of GPs and other medical specialists. Uh, after the presentation, we'll have around 10 to 15 minutes for Q&As. Now, this will be based on the chat, and I'll be moderating the chat. Not all the uh, um, questions, obviously, will be answered tonight. I have put in the chat briefing uh, information about where to get uh, assistance in terms of the website, Aviation Medicals. There's some good information on our website. There's the CASA AVMED team mailbox uh, is in there, but we also ask that you consider contacting your DAMI if you have any questions. Some of the rules and housekeeping rules, are the cameras and mics are muted, except for Kate and myself. If you have a question, please use the chat function. Now that's at the top left of the AVMED webinar. So just go to that and click on that. Um, please don't discuss individual medical cases. This is clearly not the forum for that. And uh, if you don't get to your question today, I've given you some resources uh, to look at. So today I also wanna begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, it's the Eora Creek Nation and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I also extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. And now I'll hand over to Dr. Kate. Thank you. Awesome, thanks very much, Tony, for that introduction. And um, first of all, just like to um, uh, say well, I needed you on from Darwin land down on the south coast of New South Wales. Um, that's a greeting that that is shared by my kids at school um, uh, when we um, have a gathering together just in recognition of the time and effort that people have, have taken to to join the gathering and and a, a wish for safe travels onwards once we finish our gathering today. So well, I needed you on from Darwin country. Um, so sharing with you today um, some, some things about AVMED um, and the essence of it is that just to demystify some of, of who we are and what we do as, as, um, as Tony mentioned. Um, and the first thing I wanted to do is demystify whether or not we're real doctors. Every now and then we do get um, uh, a you're not even a real doctor. Yes, I am. Look, I even work in a clinic, have a stethoscope. I'm not afraid to use it. There you go. That's all I'll do with that. For now, um, so I'm not going to not, not going to be doing any invasive procedures on you today. All right, demystifying AVMED. Um, we have already uh, done acknowledgement of country, um, and thank you, Tony, for doing that for us at the start, and also some of the ground rules. Um, and we call this part one because we actually do have an intention to have a series of of these webinars uh, over time. So um, we're going to start with. Um, covering some ground that we did cover last year as well and we did the same thing, but we think it's worth it because there's more people who are able to dial in um, for us this evening than might have been there last time. So we're going to talk about who we are, who's who in the zoo that is AVMED, uh, what do we do, what is the point of us, um, how we do what we do, and then hopefully have an opportunity for some Q&A. I will try really hard not to talk too much. Those of you who know me know that that's really hard for me to do because I tend to go on a bit, so I'll try to keep myself in check. So, starting off with who we are, so you've seen Dr. Hochberg at the start, you've seen me, this is us before we put our makeup on in the morning. Um, I am the Wicked Witch of the West, my job is to be uh, nasty and horrible, to come and get you and your medical certificate too, um, and uh, ruin your day. And of course, Tony is uh, yelling at people to get off my lawn, being intolerant and that kind of stuff, because that's what we do at AVMED. And of course it's not. Um, hopefully you can already see we're normal human beings, we're doctors, we're here, we are here to help. Um, and I'll talk a bit later about what it is our job to do is to keep people flying safely. And we really treasure that opportunity to be able to do that. We have a group of amazing senior medical officers. You might be familiar with the, uh, with the story of Sisyphus who was destined to push that rock uphill. And every time Sisyphus got to the top, it rolled back down again. That feels like our inbox. That feels like the in-tray of medicals. 30,000 medicals a year come in um, and 
Many of them are automatically processed or processed by our assessors who, who know what to do. Um, but of course, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, actually thousands, go to our medical offices. Um, work comes in, work goes out. To let you know who we are, though, um, again, that thing gets often said about who you even are. I'm so sorry I haven't updated this particular list of doctors, but we do have an amazing team of really highly qualified doctors. All of them are aerospace medicine specialists. Many of them are fellows of the College of GPs, fellows of the Faculty of Occupational Medicine uh, and Physicians. They are um, fellows of the College of Aerospace Medicine, the Royal Aeronautical Society, academicians, fellows of the Aerospace Medicine Association. We're actually punching above our weight as, as Australia often does with our qualifications and our skills and our knowledge. So um, before you kind of throw us under the bus and say we're not real doctors, you, you really do have an amazing team of clinicians who are working really hard to, um, to bring their expertise into play so that we can find a way to keep you flying. Um, and as I've said, there's a whole bunch of fellowships. There's a lot of post nominals there that we, um, we have fun um, saying out loud when we get to. Who doesn't like a fake chasm? Now, our assessors are um, uh, CASA employees whose job it is to look at the medicals when they come in. You will often get letters from signed by a medical assessor, um, and that's because our doctors can't be handling all 30,000 odd medicals that come in. We do have to have a team of supporters. Um, and in the same way in GP land, that we don't have the GP do everything. Sometimes the practice nurse does something or the medical practice assistant does something. We also have assessors to help us do things as well. They follow uh, guidelines that have been approved, designed, uh, developed um, by our medical officers, usually, not usually, always in collaboration with other international regulators, referencing ICAO and the clinical guidelines for the Australian colleges um, of all the body systems that we're working with. So that's what the assessors do. When you ring up and have a go at us about MRS not working, which we know happens, uh, it's the assessors that are gonna pick up the phone first. Um, you know that thing about catching more flies with honey? Really works with the assessors. If you ring up and shout and abuse and be horrible and unkind and inappropriate, you're less likely to achieve your outcome. If you ring up and you're civil and respectful and appropriate, um, you're more likely to get a positive outcome. There you go. Um, so that's our assessors. They do an amazing job and they do um, perhaps an un unrecognised and unrewarded job sometimes and we need to um, acknowledge them and what they do. Now, that thing about you're not a real specialist and my specialist says things and so on when you have your medical certificate assessed, we we are specialists in aerospace medicine, but we also consult really widely with specialist advisors who are specialised in their field of medicine, and they also have specific training in aviation medicine, so they understand our system and how it works. So when CASA sends a letter that says this is what we want, if you see one of these specialists or we engage with one of these specialists, we're more likely to do it once and do it right and do it properly. Other specialists sometimes will say, well, I don't think they should have that information and I don't think I need to give them that information and I'm just going to say you're fit to fly. Well, because they don't know our system and understand the way the process works and all of the regs and ICAO and our guidelines, we're going to end up going back to you again and again and again because we need our information. Um, we are in the process of working with ANU to get more and more of these CASA accredited AVMED consultants um, trained up. And you can already find some cardiology colleagues on the CASA website, and we're going to have some specialists in the other fields available as well, which is going to be, uh, yeah, really cool. Um, so many more of those specialists to, uh, to be trained. Um, we're also not out on our own here, so we are part of um, a National Aviation Authority uh, guidance group or governance group that we get together. We have a working group of the senior medical officers of each of those organisations. So we work really closely, particularly with US, UK, Canada, New Zealand, also with EASA, the, um, the European Aviation Safety Authority, and of course with our colleagues at ICAO and the medical section at ICAO. So we're not just doing something thinking, oh, I don't know, let's just do this and see how we go. We do, particularly in rare and challenging cases, we will go, uh, go outside and, and I'll get in touch with the federal air surgeon over in the US and say, hey, what do you guys do with this? What would you do if this was presented to you? 
obviously they're a lot bigger. They have 10 times as many. They have 300,000 medicals a year, not just 30,000. And they have a big staff of all those specialists I've just mentioned. So we are, can tap into that as well and say, oh, look, can you get your neurophysiologist to have a look at this? Or have you got a psychiatrist that specialises in PTSD? Oops, they do. They'll help us with that too. They're quite amazing. We also tap into the Australian College Guideline Group. So that's things like the Cardiac Society of Australia, New Zealand, the Royal Aust Australasian College of Psychiatry. Um, they develop clinical practice guidelines that are evidence-based and that, that's best practice in Australia. That's, that's your textbook. That's what you want to follow. And that's what we follow. So, for example, um, recently had a case of um, needing to have an eye assessment done. And we said, Let, let's get that done in a year. And the applicant was pretty upset about that. They wanted to wait two years for it. Um, and our response was, look, that's actually what the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Ophthalmologists says. They say it should be checked in a year. I'm not just doing this off my own bat. I'm not making a decision that's not informed. I'm just following the specialist guidelines. So that's what we do. We consult with them. We're certainly not winging it, I promise. So that's who we are and who's who in the zoo. Now, what do we do? What do we do? What we do is this. Everybody gets a grounding. You're grounded and you're grounded. Did you sneeze? You're grounded for that. No, we don't. No, we don't. Now, of course, it's like complaints on Google reviews and that kind of stuff. People who had a perfectly suitable um, uh, outcome don't tend to get online and say, I just had a suitable outcome. What you do hear is the people who are sad and angry and disappointed. You hear our, our horror stories, of course, and absolutely we're not perfect. But what you don't hear all the time is the times that we got people back to flying, where we helped work through with their treating doctors, with their dami, with them, with their employer, with their flying club to figure out a way to get them back to flying. It's not just about grounding people all the time. Now, we have rules and they're not guidelines, they're rules. We have rules that we have to follow. So we have an obligation as a National Aviation Authority, as a signatory to the Chicago Convention that ICAO works through, we have an ob obligation to follow that uh, as much as we possibly can. Um, and in particular, when it relates to playing nicely with the world, so that's the ATPL and the international operations, we have to follow these rules. So again, it's not just me saying, I want your ophthalmologist to see you every 12 months. It's actually the college guidelines but it actually goes all the way back up to Annex 1 to Chapter 6 of the ICAO Standards and Recommended Practices and the Manual of Civil Aviation Medicine that we're referring to. We have to comply with that. Now, we're a sovereign nation. ICAO doesn't set our rules and our laws, but because we're signatory to that Chicago Convention, we put that in place through the Civil Aviation Act, a Commonwealth Act, that says this is how we nationally comply with the ICAO SARPs. Um, to put those into play at the coalface, we have the regs, the regulations, and part 67 of the regs is the medical part. Part 67 spells out the standards, and, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty tight, pretty strict, just like ICAO is, and essentially what the standards say is you must not have anything wrong with you. That's about it. So that's why if there's something even a bit wrong with your ingrown toenail, grounded. Got a cataract, grounded. Heart attack, grounded. It's not that simple, though. I'll talk about that in a minute. There's more to it than that. We have some more guidance materials that we put into place, as most of our regs do. So the DAMI handbook, the Designated Aviation Medical Examiner's Handbook, helps the DAMIs to understand what they do and how they do it, more of the processes and administration around it. The clinical practice guidelines that we publish, and there's about 50 odd of those, and we're working on updating those and doing some new ones. The CPGs is what helps your DAMI understand what tests and things they ought to be providing so that CASA AVMED can make a decision about your medical. Um, they also help DAMIs who are authorised to issue certificates, so that's class two at the moment, to do that, and they follow the clinical practice guidelines to do that. We're working on a manual of standards that matches part 67, and that, again, is a beautifully updated version of the DAMI handbook and the CPGs. That's a big job. We're working on it. We'll get back to you on that, but it's, it's definitely in process. Um, all of those things are informed by evidence-based medical practice and risk assessment. So this is about how we decide whether or not even though you don't seem to be entirely perfectly well and normal like ICAO and the regs require, the way that you're not perfectly normal and well 
isn't unsafe. Um, and we do checks on that to make sure that you stay safe. And we do that by following evidence-based medical practice. But remembering pilots are very special. What you do is very special. It's very important. It is unique. It is highly valuable. It's critical to our, our community. It is such an important job. It's very different to the Mark I human doing a sea level job at sea level. And so our clinical practice guidelines, evidence-based practice guidelines, I should say, are developed by the College of GPs and Ophthalmology and Psychiatry for the Mark I human going about their business at sea level doing their thing. They're not designed for a really tightly managed risk context. They're not designed for a complex safety management system. They're not designed for being above sea level and doing high performance things in many cases. And that's why we, as well as the medical practice guidelines, we also have to do our aeromedical risk assessment. I said before that we're specialists in aerospace medicine. That's because we know how to do that and how to make that call to say, yes, this is safe, not just at sea level for the Mark I human in the car, but it's also safe for that same human at 10,000 or 30,000 feet or at 1G or 2G or 9G and so on. That's what we do. Now, when we issue certificates, um, the regs say that if you've had your examination, you've answered all the questions truthfully and honestly, you've given all the information that's been required, so you've had your blood glucose and your lipids and your eye test and maybe your stress ECG or whatever, it's all been done. Either it says that you are perfectly normal and, and entirely well, so you meet the standard, or it says, well, you don't meet the standard, but the way in which you don't meet the standard is not unsafe. So we are required to issue you a certificate. We don't have discretion to say, hmm, I don't think I'm going to do that in this case. We issue the certificate. We have to, because the regs say. So what do we do when that standard is not met? Now, this is one of those really challenging ones. This is where we start to get a bit more of a judgment call. The Manual of Civil Aviation Medicine from ICAO is really helpful. The clinical practice guidelines, the consultation with our international colleagues to reach a conclusion that says that you're not unsafe, even though you don't meet the standard. So ICAO says that we must not issue the certificate unless we figured out that in special circumstances that you're probably not going to jeopardise flight safety. And we take into account who you are, what you do, how you're doing it, operational conditions. So maybe we're going to say, well, maybe somebody else in the cockpit to take over if you become impaired or incapacitated, or maybe because of the way your eyes work, you should only be flying during the day that sort of thing. Maybe the certain medication you're on means that your G tolerance is terrible, so you're not allowed to do aerobatics, not for high performance kind of work. So we take all of that in, into consideration. That's what ICAO says that we have to do. And ICAO says that we put that on the certificate that says not valid for aerobatics, for example, not valid for night flying, that sort of thing. That's where what we put on the certificate, that's where we're allowed to do it. And our regs, because ICAO doesn't set Australian laws, we do, our regs say that we're allowed to do that. We can issue the certificate subject to a condition. Those conditions that appear on your certificate, that's our way of saying, well, ICAO says we shouldn't give you a certificate, but we're going to anyway because we can treat that risk. That is our job, to find a way to help, keep you flying, to find a way to keep you controlling aircraft, even when you don't meet the standard. And we do that through a risk assessment process. We look at risk treatments or risk mitigators to manage either the likelihood that you're going to become impaired or incapacitated or the consequences of your impairment and incapacity. Likelihood is a calculation. It is done on a numerical basis. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and it is a medical thing. We look at the medical literature. What are the chances of this person having another heart attack in the next 10 years? What are the person? What are the chances of this person's glaucoma progressing to the point that they can't see properly in the next one year, two years, five years? The likelihood. The medical evidence is pretty good on most of those things where we've got literature that we can actually get a percentage risk. Then the consequences, we look at that. All right, well, if the chances of you having a heart attack are pretty low, um, but if you did have a heart attack, if we have somebody else in the cockpit to take over from you, then, then that's okay. The consequences won't be um, uh, impact with terrain. The consequences will be that somebody else will take over and land and call an ambulance and get you looked after. So we manage those two. It is about risk, likelihood consequence. Now, I talked about numerical values. Um, 
It's one of the tenets that we have internationally as well as in Australia that we do have this annualised likelihood threshold that we use. For class one, high risk, therefore we have a tighter uh, risk acceptance and that's a 1% per annum. So there's a one in 100 chance of this thing happening to you. If it's less than that, it's okay. It's within the tolerances of the system. If it's more than that, then we need to put some mitigators. And we push that out to 2% when we have somebody else in the cockpit. So a multi-crew limitation, then we can accept up to a one in 50 chance, a 2% chance over the duration of this certificate that this thing will happen to you, that you will have another episode of a stroke or another episode of something else. If that likelihood is more than 2%, even with multi-crew, then that's outside the tolerance of the, of the system. And that's the ones where we say, look, we can't give you a certificate now. We can't find a way. We can't mitigate that out. That's the threshold that we use. For class two and three, it is a different risk picture. Um, you're not doing uh, the higher risk things that the class one is doing. You're not entrusted with higher risk and higher safety consequence things. And therefore, those tolerances are different as well. So a class two pilot, you're allowed to have a one in 50 chance of becoming incapacitated before you need a mitigator in the aircraft. Class three, air traffic control, you, you don't have the stresses of flight and the altitude environment. So again, it's a bit more permissive. And if you have somebody else there, proximity endorsement for the class three, or you have a safety pilot for class two, we then allow that to be even more likely that you're gonna have a problem. Um, it is an annualised risk because we do need to, we, we can't predict, our, my crystal ball isn't that good. I don't actually own one, there you go. I've got a broomstick, but not a crystal ball. Um, we annualise it because that's the way the medical literature works. Um, and that's also a reasonable approach to not have you going back for a medical every six months. That's a bit unkind, but it doesn't stretch it out. A lot can change in a lot of diseases over more than a year. So a 12 month annualised risk is the way we go. So that's what we do when we try to find a way to keep you flying. I said before about getting that medical evidence and the medical information. Um, that's what we, that's the information we need to quantify your risk. So let's look at the cardiac picture. If we need to know that your likelihood of having this thing happen to you is less than one in a hundred over the next 12 months. The way that we know that is by putting it into a risk calculator that's been developed with hundreds of thousands of data points um, that tells us that of people who had this situation just like yours, this many had another heart attack in the next five years. And this many had another heart attack in the next 10 years. And those data points that we use to stratify your risk, that's the information we're asking for. We're not asking because we want to be difficult or painful. We're not asking if we want to be horrible. We're asking because we need that to stratify your risk and to quantify. If we don't have enough data points, and one of the things that our regs requires is actually for us to make the most safe decision that we can with the information available. So if that information is not provided and not available, the most safe decision that we can make may be more restrictive, may actually mean no certificate because I can't make a decision with no information, or it may be a more restricted certificate. So, well, I can't mitigate your risk if I don't really know what your risk is to start with because we didn't get the information we needed. So we might be pestering you for the data point. Now your treating specialist might say, but I don't think you should, I don't think you need that. You might not need it for, from their perspective in terms of making a decision about whether or not to start your eye drops or whether or not to start a certain medication. I get that, but we need it to whether or not to issue your medical certificate. And that's a really important point of difference. We're not just deciding about your healthcare. We're not deciding about your healthcare. That's not my job. We're deciding about your air medical risk. That's why we need the data points. Um, we do invite, you might've seen in some of your, the letters that, that go out, we do invite your treating specialist. If we've got the risk wrong, we're saying we think it's, it's 3%. If you think that your pilot patient or controller patient is fit to fly, that's fine. On what basis are you saying that? That's what we're saying is if you think that their risk is 1%, we've run it through at 3% through our literature, you, doctor, please give me your, give me your data. I might have missed something. I might have not got the latest article or research. Quantify that risk for me if we're getting it wrong. We'll update our guidelines if there's more information out there. And that's we will always invite that treating specialist to say, if you think the risk is different to what we've assessed, share that with us. Tell us how you reached your conclusion. We'd love to reach the same conclusion with the same evidence. What we can't do 
is do it just because. We can't do it because because I said. Sometimes our, our our esteemed colleagues will say, but I'm but I'm a professor. Good. However, being a professor doesn't quantify risk. So, um, all right. Now, the last one of the last things to talk about, the class five. Another way to find a way to get people medicals. Um, so this is something hopefully you've heard a little bit about uh, for private and recreational pilots if they want to. Um, and this is one of the ways you know, our organisation has tried to find a way to help people keep flying rather than make people who are safe. We've sort of um, set some parameters and a framework to say, well, if you fall within this box, you are safe enough that we don't even need to look at you. As long as you fall within that box and you're good to go and you stay within that box in terms of what you do. And that box was designed by a number of technical working groups. We had a really great industry consultative group that got together that set those parameters. What does that box look like? We had some really clever, very informed aerospace medicine specialists who looked at the medical bits of the box and the operational people from all walks of life, um, all sorts of representative groups. No, it wasn't all doctors. In fact, there was only two, two doctors on that group, um, one of which was me as a facilitator, came up with what that box looks like. And that box is the class five. It is allowing pilots to assess themselves if they're fit to fly. Now that struck fear into the heart of a lot of people. How can we possibly trust pilots? Um, and even some research that's been published recently and that's being reproduced in New Zealand as we speak and is about to roll out from the Uni of New South Wales. So if you get an invitation to do the UNSW study, please do it. Um, that tells us that in a 27% of, of cases, a pilot will decide not to disclose things to their medical examiner because they're worried they'll lose their medical certificate. And in almost 60%, 57% of cases, Pilots will choose not to get healthcare because they're so worried that they're going to lose their license. Now, we don't want you to be so afraid of seeking help that you end up not getting help and you get sicker as a result. Um, so, you know, we, we're going to trust you with this one. We're going to trust you with class five. So you self-assess. Do you think you're eligible for a class five? There are some published guidelines, um, the guidelines for medical self-declaration, medical self-assessment. Now, those guidelines were built on and referenced to the fitness to drive standards. I said 1%, 2%. Fitness for drive for private motor vehicles is 20%. So we're very, very happy for people to have a one in five chance of having a seizure or a heart attack behind the wheel. We don't have the same risk tolerance in aviation but we have a better risk tolerance for class five because of those operational limitations that go with that. So the guidelines were created referencing the fitness to drive, but there's a whole bunch of things that weren't in fitness to drive that are relevant for aviation. Things like lung diseases, pretty important if you're going to get hypoxic up there. Um, cancers, again, pretty important if you've got a brain tumour and you go to altitude, that's an issue. So if you think you're eligible, Go to those guidelines and have a look. If you have a disease or a medical condition, read those guidelines. And if the guidelines say, well, if you've got heart failure, you can't self-assess your own ejection fraction. It's just not something you can't say, hey, heart, how? here we go. Can I do it myself? No, I can't. You need to talk to your doctor about your heart failure and a few other things as well that you do need to consult. So you go and get that advice. And with that advice, referencing the guidelines, you assess yourself. There are some exclusion criteria in the instrument for class five as well. This is all on the CASA website that you can have a look at, some medications. And essentially it's things that either make it impossible for you to assess yourself, either because your brain doesn't work well enough, so that's things, things like dementia and psychotic disorders, you can't decide for yourself, or it can never be predicted. Your brain works just fine in terms of thinking it through, but you just don't know when this thing is going to happen. And that things like seizure disorders, Again, some of the psychotic disorders where you don't know when your next event might happen. Medications will also stop you from being able to self-assess and you can't assess how well they're impacting you. So, um, I mean, alcohol is a great example of that. Obviously, it's not a medication, but um, you, it's very, very hard to self-assess. Am I 0.05 or 0.07 or 0.02? Don't know. You can't self-assess that. Is my dose of narcotic analgesia too high, too low, not enough? You can't self-assess. And in fact, it's almost impossible to assess that from a safety relevant perspective. So that's why they're on the excluded list for class five. 
So once you've done that, you've self-assessed, yes, actually, I'm good to go. I've had a chat with my doc. I'm OK, good to go. Then you make that declaration. It's done through the MRS uh, medical record system online through um, through my CASA. And after you've done that, I think I'm eligible. So you make that self-declaration. And in doing that, you commit to staying within those operational limitations that the technical working group recommended and that were established through consultation. Now those, again, they weren't made up just because. Um, there's a, an international comparison chart as well as to see how we compare from for overseas with that, and it's uh, it's not too bad. So it is below 10,000 feet because that's the point at which our lungs and our heart don't work particularly well above that altitude because of pressure differentials and oxygen gas exchange at cellular level. This is all very sciencey, which is amazing. I love it. Um, it's day VFR only. Uh, no formation and arrows. Again, you can't self-assess your G tolerance. You can't self-assess your visual field defect. Just you just can't do it. Um, uh, only two POB, so don't be taking passengers with you. That's about a consequence management. Um, it's all on the CASA website. It's all in the instruments, what they are. That's your class five. Now, what do we do if, if it turns out you're actually not eligible and you shouldn't have been doing it? Um, we committed, uh, we were required to commit to a post-implementation review, and that's going to be done as well. If it comes to our attention through our audit and post-implementation review that an incorrect self-assessment was done, then we'll say, well, turns out you're actually not eligible for a class five. Um, we're not going to be hauling people over the coals for making a deliberate or misleading statement. There's other parts of the regs that will allow people to be getting in big trouble for doing that. Um, you can't regulate for bad actors. Some people are just going to be dicey. And that's it. We, and we don't want to regulate um, everyone into the ground because of a few people who who can't have nice things. So um, if we find that you've made an incorrect assessment, it actually means, sorry, you're not eligible after all per the instrument. Let's find another way to get you flying if we can. Anyway, that's class five in a very brief nutshell. Now. This is about demystifying AVMED and, you know, Oprah, we're grounding everybody. Um, one of the things that's a really important uh, picture to paint for you is how rare it actually is for us to ground people. So I said before, about 30,000 medical certificates are processed every year um, uh, for about 25,000 individual certificate holders because, of course, the ones get a two automatically almost every time. So that's the numbers that are coming through. That was that uh, up until 30 June 2022. I haven't done last year's numbers yet. These are the ones that were um, cancelled or refused. Of all the ones that came in, these are the ones we said, no, we really, we can't give you a medical certificate. So if you look at the reasons why we're saying no, it's because they've just recently had a heart attack and they're not better yet. Or it's because they've recently had a massive stroke and they can't move the left side of their body. Or because they've been admitted to a psychiatric hospital with a psychotic disorder and they're now on a bunch of medications and that's not appropriate for operating an aircraft safety. Perhaps they've had a seizure or they've got a brain tumour or they've got early dementia or they've got a disease that means they can't stand up properly because they lose their balance so much. Perhaps they're on dialysis and their electrolytes are all over the place, which, again, really big risk of heart attack, stroke, seizure. Um, they can't see properly and they just you, you do need to be able to see to be able to fly. Um, severe enough sleep apnea. Don't underestimate the power of sleep apnea to make you very, very unwell. Um, cancers that have spread, diabetes that is really badly controlled. Again, chances of having an event that is a heart attack, a stroke, um, kidney failures, things like that with diabetes, really big deal. These are people who are really, really actually quite unwell. So they're the ones that we say, now is not the time for you to be flying. Um, so there's uh, 630 odd, somebody can probably do the maths for me if you're, if you're that quick, take a screenshot, there you go. Um, they're the ones that we say, no, we're going to refuse or cancel your certificate. There's also some who say, you know what, don't worry about it. I don't want a certificate. Um, and they've said, I'm just, I'm not going to fly for a little while while I work through this. So there's, there's also those ones that come in that we didn't do, that they did. Now, of all of those ones that were cancelled or refused, I then had a look at those files and said, well, that's just then. So heart attack, right? They've had a heart attack. Cancel your certificate. You've just had a heart attack. I hope you get better soon. I hope it turns out well and you don't have a, cons a complication. But once your heart attack has settled and you've had your treatment, you've had your stent put in, you're on your antiplatelets, you're on your beta blocker, you're on your lipid control, your glucose is under control, everything is tickety-boo, you've been repaired essentially, you're going to be reinstated. So, yes, you're grounded until you're better. And that's our find a way. You don't meet the standard anymore. 
but the way in which you might don't meet the standard is not unsafe. So of all the ones that said, can I have a certificate, we've said no. And of all the ones that have said, um, or that we've said, give that certificate back, and the ones that we've said stand down for a little while, that's how many of them end up going back to flying. So if you look at the overall number, it's 0.3%, three in every thousand certificates are the ones that we're just not gonna be able to find a way. And again, these are the things, your terminal cancers and your dementia and your stroke and your end stage kidney disease. These people are really, really very unwell. Comparing to the FAA, a lot of people say, oh, but the FAA is so much better. They're so much more special. Um, we're strict, we're harsh, we're horrible. We're the same. They have a 0.3% final denial rate in the last financial year. And that was data that was presented by the Federal Day Surgeon in New Zealand a few weeks ago. So snap. Um, we we punch above our weight, we actually, we do really well and we're on a par with our colleagues internationally. So that's what we do. All right, so nearly 40 minutes of Dr. Kate going on. In summary, that's who we are. We are experts, we're aerospace medicine physicians. We are experts in getting you back to flying and finding a way to get you back to flying as safely and as early as we possibly can. What we do is we find that way and we do that really detailed comprehensive risk assessment. We work with you and your treating doctors and your treating specialists on that by asking for the information that we need to make a decision, to find a way. And that's when we send out that letter that says, please give us this test, this form, this report. We need it to be able to find a way. Otherwise, we have to revert to the most safe option, which is to say no, and we don't like to say no. What we, how do we do it with our flexibility, uh, flexibility provisions, consulting and collaborating with you, your doctors, with our colleagues overseas, with ICAO, with your employer, with your flying club, with anybody else that we can work with to see how we can help keep you safe. That's what we do. All right. I am now bracing myself for questions. Let me end the slideshow and let's see what you want to yeah, hi Kate. I might just ask you a question, if that's okay. Yeah. We've, we've had a few which I've responded to on the chat. Um, tell us about class four. Obviously, we've got class one, two, three, and five. What uh, mm -hmm. what's happening with class four? And yeah, so class mean? four. Yeah, if we go back to the aviation medicine technical work, the Part sixty seven technical working group that was convened in twenty twenty. Um, they recommended another pathway to a medical certificate that was issued by your doctor, by your GP. And what they suggested is that that was a class four. And it got a bit complicated. They were suggesting that the class four allowed either a self-declared or a GP pathway, depending on. And the Aviation Safety Advisory Panel and the Aviation Safety Committee said, well, that's a bit complicated. Lots of pathways, lots of fiddling around. Let's make two. Let's make a five and a four. So the five is with your specialist GP and the four, that's the five is with your self-declared and the four is with your specialist GP. The priority was given to the class five as the self-declared medical. So that's where we put all of our effort in the last 12 months. And that was rolled out in February of this year. Now the class four, a medical that is examined and issued by a doctor who is not an aviation medical examiner, is something that ICAO is looking at. So if you look at the ICAO assembly papers from a couple of years ago, the International Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, IAOPA, has put forward a presentation to suggest that there should be a world recognized medical certificate. They're calling it class 2R at the moment, that is issued by a doctor who's not a medical examiner, that doesn't have to go through the medical regulator. So that's essentially what our class 4 is going to be. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking and watching and observing and working with ICAO as they review the IAOPA proposal at the Air Navigation Commission and see where it lands. And hopefully that will be in the next um, the next year or so. What we don't want to do is preempt that and design our own version only to find that ICAO has done something different and we have to redesign it. So it's not that far away. We're working internationally to make sure that ours matches what the world is doing. We are on the panel that is working with IOPA and ICAO to develop that 2R that will ultimately probably be our class four. And that's where it's at. Great. And um, an expected question on where we are at with colour vision deficiency. 
So. Absolutely. So, um, so we had our, our public consultation, which closed on the 14th of April just recently, and it was it was really impressive. So we had 94 responses, which is actually quite significant for a public consultation to the draft instrument, which allows an operational assessment to be done to decide whether or not someone meets the standard. That's the intent of the instrument. Um, and the idea of that is that up until now, we haven't had a specific legally binding and enforceable determination by CASA on how we do colour vision assessments outside the regs. So the regs say you do your Ishihara, which is your colourful plates that you do at the GP, you, at the DAMI. You've got to do that every year because OKO says so. You do your Farnsworth Lantern if you didn't pass the Ishihara. And then after that, it gets a bit vague in the regs. And that's where we've had some grayness, where we haven't had a specific determination published. And that's what the new instrument's going to do. Now, that instrument is currently in draft form. I've seen some emails come in this evening. The instrument is supposed to be signed later this week or within this week. And it will be with effect from um, mid-May, I think we're aiming for, for a new assessment to be available that is within the, an instrument that says this is what we do. So that's where we're up to with colour vision. So very, very, very close to having an instrument made and the instrument will take effect from around about mid-May. And that's there's a whole lot of work. That's why Kate looks really, really tired. Um, there's a whole lot of work that's gone into that. Tony, Dr. Hotchberg has been doing a whole, a whole bunch of work on that leading up until now, a lot of consultation, technical working groups, collaboration to get to the point that this is gonna be, uh, gonna be live very, very soon. So there you go. That's where Colour Vision is up to. Great. I think there's probably just a question around um, procedures and it's a there's one there from Neil, which I think you might be able to see in your chat, but um, I think he's asking a few questions there about um, as a with co-pilot, perhaps when that can be removed. Mm. Um, you know, that's a, a complex question, but I'll hand over to you about that particular restriction and how we might remove it. Yeah, absolutely. So every new medical certificate application is a new application. So it's it's um it's each one is is assessed on its merits and of course referring to what's happened to you before. Um where your specialist, your treating doctor says this has been done and this is how it is. Um we look at the data for that disease, for that treatment, how effective is it? How effective and we look at the long-term data on that that surgical correction in this case to say, well this has been fixed. Um over the next five years, what's the likelihood of it happening again? Is there anything we can do to predict it happening again or prevent it from happening again? Any checks that we can put into place? And it gets back to that likelihood assessment. If we can quantify that risk to be that likelihood to be low enough, we remove the mitigator. If the likelihood is still high enough that we can't issue a clean certificate, a clear certificate, then we'll look at ways to mitigate that. So, um, if your treating specialist says this person is no likelier than the average Joe on the street to have a have a, a condition, kind of comes to what I said before. If we've said, well, 15 journal articles that we've read say that you are actually much more likely than the average person to have that happen again, your doctor's saying that that's not the case, that you are no more likely than everyone. Just, just tell us on what, what, what basis you're making that call because we can't find anything that says that that's the case in our medical literature search. What have we missed? And that's where we say to those doctors, tell us what we've missed. Where is the literature, the evidence and the data that says that's the case? Give it to us. We'll change our guidance in a heartbeat. Uh, but if you can't provide us with anything other than because I think so, we can't make an error medical decision and issue a certificate under our regs that goes outside that evidence-based liter literature framework. So, so that's how you get it removed. You provide us with the evidence uh, for the risk assessment. There you go. Yeah, I might ask a sort of technical one just on the class five I know we discussed this quite a bit leading up to it. it's about formation flying and why that was excluded specifically from class five mm. sure so that was something that we discussed quite a bit with the technical working group as well um, and the essence of it is um, we're looking at likelihood of there being something so essentially a, an aircraft accident with fatalities how likely is it to happen in certain operational conditions how likely is it for this person who hasn't had anybody look at them in terms of their fitness and their safety? And what are the consequences of that happening? So formation flying in particular is, is a really interesting one. Enabled to, and again, these were pilots 
gliders, recreational pilots, um, uh, commercial pilots who were in this technical working group. It wasn't it wasn't just Dr. Kate saying. Um, formation flying requires you to be able to judge speed, distance, proximity. It relies particularly on a lot of peripheral visual cues. So the cues that we get from outside. So the central vision, the, the NVG tube vision, which is the bit that you use to read and to look at this screen right now, is only the central sort of roughly 20 degrees. But we actually rely on all of the other peripheral vision and visual cues to judge how far we are away from things and distance and movement. So we need full and functional visual fields to judge that distance and that movement safely, which is what you need for formation. So if you can't self-assess a loss of peripheral visual field, so I'm looking at my screen, if I can't see that finger wiggling, you, you can't, you can't self-assess visual field. So you can't self-declare something that you can't self-assess. So that's why you can't self-assess whether or not it's going to be okay for formation flying. Then on the consequence side is formation flying means that there are two aircraft involved. And that says that there's more than one person in this one aircraft or two, two PIB for class five. So potentially four people who might be exposed to a fatal outcome if we've been unable to self-assess our visual fields. So putting together the medicine and the science and the risk and the likelihood, the consequence, the risk appetite, that's where we came up with no formation flying for class five. There you go. That's great. Um, I think um, a question around clinical case conferences, what mm -hmm. is the value of that? What, you know, this is about us trying to improve our, our image. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is a question around that. So maybe have a chat about that. Yeah, most definitely. So, um, you know, part of the reason why we're doing this, this um, webinar today is to demystify things and to help people understand our decision processes and how they work and why a decision might be made in a certain way uh, for us um, and, you know, our find a way kind of process. The clinical case conference is something that was brought in a couple of years ago. And again, Dr. Hochberg runs most of those for us, which is an opportunity to speak with one of the world's leading specialists in aerospace medicine about the decision that was made and help to understand what are the data points and how does it work and why is that just to clarify and explain so that everybody's on the same page because often it's like black box medical goes in decision comes out what happened in here and why and that lack of information and understanding it's really disempowering I understand that and so to bring you inside the black box and say well this is what we did and why and how it worked and that kind of stuff that's what the clinical case conference uh, is intended to do and we've had um oh, a couple of dozen now, I think, Tony, that have gone really, really well, haven't they? And, and been really positive. It doesn't mean you're going to change your outcome, but hopefully it means you will understand the whys about it. And people leave saying, well, I understand now and, and I'm grateful for that. Now, what I will say is your Damie is also well and truly capable of talking you through the process and why. So you don't need to email CASA and say, I want to have a Teams with you guys um, and it might take a while to set up and, and, and be a bit to plan. Your Damie can actually do that for you nine times out of ten. And every now and then we do get a message from the Damie that says, oh, gosh, I wish they'd asked me because I could have explained that to them and helped them with that. So Clinical case conference, absolutely they're available when we're keen to support people to help understand what goes on and demystify our, our decisions. But please use your Damie as well. They're a very important, very useful source of information for you. There you go. I think we'll probably just take uh, one more of the chats. Uh, there's the one around sleep apnea. Uh, what is the worst... Um, or is there a CASA test that someone would have to do for their license? Perhaps just a little bit around sleep apnea because it's such a common yeah. condition in the general population. So common. so common. So obstructive sleep apnea, which is different to other kinds of sleep disordered breathing. So obstructive sleep apnea where your airway closes off while you're sleeping, makes your oxygen drop down. It makes it so that your heart, your brain, your lungs, your body is under a lot of stress while you're sleeping and it doesn't rest. Um, so that is a really significant disease. If you have obstructive sleep apnea, you are more likely to have a heart arrhythmia, a stroke, a heart attack, um, develop diabetes, develop mental health problems, lots of things. It also means that you are less likely to be able to think and react and take action and analyse data, the executive functions that you need to be able to be a pilot and do all the things, not just 
straight and level on a sunny Sunday afternoon, but all of the complex things you need to do in all circumstances. If your brain is not working properly because your oxygen was so low overnight that bad things happen to your brain, measurable decrement in performance the next day. It's like having a severe hangover. It's like being intoxicated. That's how severe the impairment can be from sleep apnea. So what assessment do we do? Uh, the first thing we do is a screening test. Let's find the people who are more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea. Now, the evidence-based questionnaire that we use for that is called the Stop Bang questionnaire. That's embedded within the MRS questionnaire, but your Damie or your GP can do the Stop Bang. We've moved away from the Epworth Sleepiness Score because it's um, it's not as reliable as Stop Bang. So Stop Bang is about snoring and um, stopping breathing and uh blood pressure treatment, about neck circumference, about body mass index, age, gender. Um, uh, forgotten the other ones. Sorry, it's getting late. Um, that If your stop bang score is low, you probably don't have sleep apnea. If your stop bang score is in the middle, you might have sleep apnea, and we'll ask you to have a test. If your stop bang score is really high, you probably have sleep apnea, and we'll definitely get that test, and you'll probably need treatment. So that's the test that you do. It's a, it's a sleep study. Um, the best sleep study is the one where you stay overnight um, in a sleep unit and they watch you because it's much more reliable. Um, if you have anything above mild, so moderate or severe sleep apnea, we will say that you need to have treatment for that because if you don't have treatment, your brain is not working properly when you're in the aircraft. Treatment is usually a CPAP device that you wear. My nine-year-old daughter wears a CPAP device and has been wearing from for four years. If she can do it, you guys can do it. There's also a mandibular advancement splint that you can wear that can work really well as well if it's about gagging and things. Again, the MAS. As long as whatever treatment you use means that your sleep apnea is not measurable anymore on your sleep study, you go back to flying. And the restriction on your certificate will say you have to use your treatment. And you have to use your treatment before you've gone flying because your brain doesn't work if you didn't sleep the night before. And that's what it will be. And as long as you keep using that, you send us a report that says, I'm using it. We say, good for you, carry on, keep flying. The only restriction is give us a copy of your report and use your sleep apnea treatment before you fly. There you go. Sorry, that's a lot Fabulous. to take in. There you go. Kate, uh, look, I think we've covered uh, a lot. The questions have been really good as well and very diverse. I think um, it's been a value nearly hour. We've sort of gone over time by about 10 minutes, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I know that you presented earlier today as well. So thank you very mm. much for uh, your enthusiasm and presentations. Um, a copy of this webinar will be available on the CASA YouTube channel at CASA Briefing. Um, unique to this uh, webinar, there will be a survey to get your thoughts uh, about how we can make things better, what things you want to see in the future. Um, and uh, thanks to all the participants uh, for your time and uh, and respectful comments as well. And I might just hand over to Kate to wind it up. Mm, thank you so much, Tony, for moderating and checking. And, you know, I'm really sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions, but we will be having another one of these, another couple of these through the year as well, as best we can. Um, I am um, just going to call out Simon Hislop. Thank you for asking the question about the UNSW study about healthcare avoidance and non-declaration by pilots. Um, as I understand, that they've gone through ethics approval, that's good to go. They're finalising their questionnaire. It will be publicised far and wide. I just want to make sure that you do know this doesn't come to us. It does not come to CASA. The only thing that we get is to read the report when it's published in the scientific journal, but it's such important data to get. So uh, when you see it out there, I'm hoping, I mean, I'm not on the research team, so I don't know for sure, but UNSW will probably be publicising it through all of your fora, probably on RDP, probably on FACI, probably on all sorts of places. So if you see UNSW study on pilot healthcare declaration and avoidance and help seeking, that's the one, sign it up. I'm really sorry they haven't done it for air traffic controllers this time. New Zealand did, well done New Zealand winning again. They didn't, but I'm hoping UNSW will do it for ATC soon. So that's my last plug for the research, please do that. Otherwise, I will just reach out once again to you all. Please be kind, work with us. Our job is to get you back to flying. Help us to do that for you as best we can by working with us. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of your industry and to share our story with you tonight. I'll wrap it up there.